Behind me is St. Peter's Basilica in Rome's Vatican City, and to my right behind those buildings is the Sistine Chapel. The Sistine Chapel is one of the most famous art museums in the world, made so by its many famous paintings by Renaissance masters like Sandro Botticelli. But by far the most famous artist is Michelangelo Buonarroti, or better known as simply Michelangelo. Michelangelo's best-known paintings are on the chapel ceiling and depict biblical events from the book of Genesis, from God separating light and darkness to Noah and the great flood. But one of the ceiling's nine central panels stands out in fame from all the others. You'd be hard-pressed to find someone in the Western world that has not seen or heard of Michelangelo's The Creation of Adam, in which God reaches out to give the spark of life to the first man. You've seen it reproduced in prints and posters, on coffee mugs and t-shirts. Sometimes the full painting, as I once saw it in full scale on the ceiling of a coffee shop in Brooklyn, and done very well, I might add, but oftentimes only the isolated hands of the two principals need be shown for instant recognition. It's amazing how such a small part of the overall work distills the essence of the work itself. It's arguably the most famous single work of art in the history of Western civilization, right up there with Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa and Vincent van Gogh's Starry Night. But while all are famous as works of art, Michelangelo's work also stands out for the idea it embodies. But it almost didn't happen. Michelangelo didn't want to paint the Sistine Chapel ceiling and initially refused when Pope Julius II ordered him to stop work on the Pope's own tomb, which Michelangelo was then designing, to do this new project instead. The artist argued that he was a sculptor and not a painter. Julius insisted, though, and four years later the world was presented with a breathtaking masterpiece that not even the Pope himself had expected. The Sistine Chapel sits beside St. Peter's Basilica, the axis mundi of world Catholicism. Commissioned to be built in 1473, it was completed ten years later in 1483. It was designed and still functions as the Pope's Chapel and is the site of all papal elections. Famously, it's the building that the white smoke rises from to announce to all the world the election of a new Pope. The chapel is built to the biblical specifications of King Solomon's temple, but the facade is architecturally unexceptional. It's the interior frescoes that have made it the focus of so much attention in the art world for over 500 years. The ceiling, though, is not the only exceptional decoration in the Sistine Chapel. The walls contain great artwork by many Renaissance masters. There is Botticelli, and also Perugino, and Michelangelo's own teacher, Ghirlandaio, Rosselli, Signorelli. They depict scenes from the lives of Moses and Jesus and form the lower tier of wall decoration. Above them are individual portraits of the succession of popes from St. Peter himself. But it was the ceiling that was slated for a makeover in 1508. Originally painted as a night sky with golden stars, Michelangelo was to reinterpret the space with what might be called divine inspiration. As I said, at first he resisted vehemently even at one point suggesting that one of his rivals do the work instead, the young Raphael. But Pope Julius would not be denied, and finally the world's greatest living sculptor agreed to paint. And what painting he did! The project required that Michelangelo work in fresco, an art form he'd been trained in but was disdainful of. Frescoes are actually painted in wet plaster. For this reason they're unique in that the painter must work quickly in a window of opportunity that often is only hours long, completing a section of work while the plaster is still wet, but not too wet. The artist must rely on a skilled plasterer for proper surface preparation. But one big advantage to fresco art is that it endures as long as the wall itself endures, since the paint is chemically embedded into the wall material not just adhering to the surface as in the more common forms of painting. Life for a fresco painter in the 16th century was not easy. Besides having to depend upon another trade for surface preparation and work quickly and accurately, he had to grind his own pigments and mix his own paints. Lighting conditions depended mostly on daylight, 
On top of all that, to paint a ceiling he must work in difficult conditions off of scaffold, many feet above the floor, contorting his body and neck to constantly work overhead. Biographies written by his contemporaries claim Michelangelo's eyesight was permanently impaired by the physical stresses of the chapel project. Michelangelo himself wrote of the toll these extreme conditions took on him in letters to his family. In one, he drew a sketch of him arching his back like a Syrian bow, as he termed it, while stretching to reach the ceiling, belying the popular conception that he lay on his back while working. That probably came from the movie The Agony and the Ecstasy, a Hollywood distortion for dramatic and cinematic impact. Problems of perspective were compounded by the fact that the artist could not see his work clearly from floor level, where it would be ultimately viewed and judged, until after it was completed and the scaffold removed. When you consider that he could not make any corrections without breaking out the dried plaster and starting from scratch, Michelangelo's expert use of perspective so that scenes read accurately from the floor is phenomenal. In fact, experts think the reason the last half of the ceiling that Michelangelo painted is stylistically bolder and more daring in perspective is that the obscuring scaffold had finally been removed from the first half and the artist for the first time could see his work from the floor and make adjustments accordingly. The creation of Adam deserves its immense fame for its sheer beauty and artistic achievement alone. Yet it's not without controversy. Much has been written about its meaning based on what some perceive as cryptic elements. Was Michelangelo imparting some secret message in coded imagery? One theory is that the red shroud framing God and his entourage is intentionally shaped like the human brain in its parts the trailing fabric being the brain stem and spinal cord. Michelangelo, an expert in anatomy, is saying, the theory goes, that God is bestowing the intellect upon Adam. Another theory claims the shroud is meant to represent a womb and the trailing fabric the umbilical cord. We as art appreciators can choose whichever interpretation we like, or perhaps another. Consider this. Now, as preface to my personal theory, we must remember that Michelangelo was a devout Christian living in the 16th century, and though certainly an intelligent thinker, he had no trouble with the church's literal biblical explanation of the world. We, as citizens of the 21st century, may doubt such simplistic rationales, but people in the Renaissance were just emerging from the so-called Dark Ages and did not have the benefit of our 500 years of science and scholarly research. So traditionally, the scene portrayed in the creation of Adam is said to depict the verse in Genesis 2 where God breathed into Adam's face the breath of life. But we can clearly see that God is not breathing on Adam and that Adam is already alive. So that moment has passed and Michelangelo, by choosing to ignore the literal Old Testament description, obviously intended to emphasize some other meaning. But just what is that meaning? It may be that the artist wanted to show that man is much more than flesh animated. We know that all life on earth is similar in that respect, from the amoeba to the gray whale. So Michelangelo perhaps is saying that God is now giving the first man that quality which makes him unique of all God's creatures. And the Bible tells us that this ingredient is the soul. And that may be all that the artist intends. But... There's at least one other possibility to consider, and for me, a big clue comes from Adam's demeanor. His facial expression and even his body language express a listlessness, a lethargy. Life is present to be sure, but there's no spark in Adam's eye, as if his mind is not yet fully engaged. In fact, there does not seem to be any expression of emotion at all, and only perhaps a vague longing for something. While God is dynamic, fully engaged, exuding power and purpose, and his entourage is vibrant and alive, a seeming maelstrom of life revolving around their source of energy. Now, consider this. If God already has bestowed the intellect on Adam, notwithstanding the brain symbolism theory, then he, Adam, might realize by virtue of his rudimentary reasoning ability that something is still lacking from his whole being, But he wouldn't know what it was. His mind is pretty much a blank slate, hence the expressive void. I think the missing ingredient might be emotion. 
the capacity for, say, passion. Man's intellect is very important in the Renaissance cultural milieu, and we know that Michelangelo, as a very intelligent man, would have valued reason. But we also know that Michelangelo was an intensely passionate man, who believed very deeply that God was the source of his creative inspiration. He was a man that acted out of passion and worked to the point of exhaustion to achieve his creative vision. So maybe Michelangelo meant this to be the moment that God gave man what he perceived as the ingredient that made him special, divine passion, the ability to feel life in its fullness. For it is from this capacity for deep emotion that man is moved to accomplish greatness. Perhaps this final gift from God, then, is passion, the lifeblood of a great artist.